G'day everyone, I'm Ian Preston from Pegos. Uh, I'm going to tell you about what a better web could be. Uh, but first, let's, uh, what's, what's wrong with the, web, with the web today? So in short, it's kind of become a bit of a su surveillance dystopia to uh, feudal overlords. It's basically every website you visit has first party surveillance, third party surveillance, you don't own the data you create, and if you have any kind of logins, then you don't own your identity either. But let's have a look at what happens when you visit a website these days. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on. So the first thing is your browser will do a DNS lookup to find the IP address to connect to. Then you'll make a TLS connection to this IP address, which involves trusting about 140 certificate authorities in your browser. Any one of those could man in the middle uh, the connection if they wanted to. Um, you don't have any direct relationship with any of these CAs typically, and most of the time the, the web host doesn't either. Um, <clears throat> so now you've, then you've got your, your TLS connection to the browser. Uh, you then load some arbitrary code. Now it's arbitrary, it could be different for different people, could be different on different devices, or two seconds later, it's arbitrary code. And then you run it. Uh, so then, then this code will probably load some third-party code. So then you're now talking to a bunch of other servers. So they know what website you've just visited and where you are, your IP address and all kinds of stuff. And then maybe it's not just a blog you're reading, maybe it's a site you're, you're using to do stuff. And so then you would log in. So then you put in whatever it is, your username and password, or you log in with some other, again, a third-party identity provider. And then you start doing stuff. I'm going to make some posts or create some documents or whatever. And so you're sending your personal data to the server, so they then own that data. And then if the site has any kind of social aspect, then there might be a, a social feed, and this will be curated according to the uh, algorithms that they choose to run, so which is to protect their, their incentives, so they want to maximize their revenue, which means maximizing uh, your, your attention. And so you end up with manipulation by AI curated feeds. And the end result of this is subverted democracy, uh, compromised consensus, society can't agree on what, what, is, what is an objective truth. Um, it's not, not a great state. So could a better design fix these problems or at least help? So I'm obviously here because I think the answer is yes. Uh, so what, but what are the requirements? So following on from the, pre from the previous talk, these basically uh, amount to user agency. So I don't need to tell anyone here about the benefits of content address data. It should also be signed, content address data, because people don't normally remember hashes. Uh, and then probably for the same reason, you need a mapping from something human memorable to a public key. Um, because again, people don't remember public keys either. Now, this, the web is actually okay at... Um, sandboxing stuff, because after all, it is a platform for running untrusted code. But they're not really, the sandboxes aren't really designed to protect you from the server you're talking to. They're mainly designed to protect the rest of your machine. Um, what else would be cool in terms of user agency would be if we could grant uh, permissions to, to these web apps to do stuff that we want them to do. Um, and in terms of any data that we create, that should be stored in something that we own and control. And to ensure that we own and control it, it should be end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, ideally, you'd be able to take your data between apps. Uh, and somehow, all of this should work in existing browsers. So this is where <laughs> Pegos comes in. So Pegos is a, a global private file system. Um, it has signed content address data, uh, human-readable paths, and it works in existing browsers. But we didn't have a safe way to run apps, or HTML5 apps, or, or a, obviously not, or a permission system for them. So we built an application sandbox. Um, basically, it, it runs, allows you to run untrusted code over private data, such that the app can't steal your data, um, and the app can't read anything it's not granted access to, uh, and there's a simple, the app, app itself has a simple REST API, but there isn't, there isn't a server. We'll get to that. 
So this is, this is how the sandbox is designed. So uh, you log into Pegos on, on the, the main domain, in this case, pegos.net. It also works on localhost. All of this works on localhost. Um, so you don't actually have to rely on DNS if you don't want to. Uh, then you, say, you, you tell Pegos, I want to open this app. And an app, as I mentioned, is just a folder of HTML5, uh, which is stored end-to-end -end encrypted itself in, in Pegos. And we load that on a, a hash domain, which we sandbox uh, in, in such a way. So there's a different sandbox for every page. Uh, the, the hash is basically the path, which, which is unique because it's a file system. Um, and what the, what the server actually does for all, or for all these subdomains, serves up, it serves up exactly the same static content. Uh, and what that, all that does, that, that small static content, is set up a service worker, which then uh, communicates with the main uh, Pegos tab via post messages. And then in the main Pegos tab, there's the thing that uh, is basically the, the trusted code which enforces the app permissions. Um, and then once the service worker has that post messaging system working, it then loads uh, a, a sub iframe for itself, which is where the app gets to render itself. And this, the CSP firewall around, uh, around the app is, yeah, as I mentioned, is designed to pr prevent exfiltrating data. So you have to worry about things like DNS prefetch um, and any other mechanism that could be used to talk to the external world. So we, uh, we have a browser app, which is kind of a special app that it, it doesn't just have one fixed domain that it runs on it. Very, it has another parameter which goes into the hash uh, so it can isolate different things that it's, it's trying to render. Um, so then you can just open any, any folder in Pegos as a, as a HTML site. You can have internal links, uh, which are relative links, or you can have external links to, to anything in, in the global Pegos file system. Uh, it works in secret links, and markdown pages work. They're rendered natively as well. Uh, I'll have a, a demo of this later. But more generally, what, what, is, what is a custom app uh, in this context? So I've said it's a, a folder of HTML5 assets. An app, you, you can install it. It can be upgraded. Installing it basically just means copying that folder into your Pegos space. Uh, and by default, uh, an app can read its own assets. So that's the minimum it can do with, with no permissions. And that, that might be enough for some things if it's like a single player game or something like that. Um, that, that could be enough. Or, or it can request more permissions from the user. Uh, an app could, uh, say, be an editor for some kind of file, so it can register for viewing or editing certain file types or MIME types. Uh, so we've got some examples uh, of apps that we've written uh, which, can, which can do things. Most of these are pre-existing web apps, as we've just done a a minor modification to work in, in Pegos. So we haven't actually written these from scratch. So the first one is a word processor, so a viewer for uh, Microsoft documents. Spreadsheets, uh, viewing and editing. An image editor, a what you see is what you get markdown editor. Tiddlywiki notebooks. Or more advanced things for apps, you could have a media player. That's more, so it needs access to more than one file in theory. Multiplayer games. Chat. How do you do chat? We'll get to that. So the app structure I mentioned has a folder of assets. Uh, there's a, a JSON file in, in the root, which is, that's the manifest. Um, so that has a bunch of stuff we'll, we'll see in a second. And one of the permissions is to store app data and what that lets the app do is to read and write to a, an app-specific private folder, but in your space. Um, so that could be settings or save games or whatever. So this is what a, uh, an app manifest looks like, roughly what you'd expect. Things like name, description, version, author. Uh, launchable is just whether, whether or not you can run it on its own uh, without opening a file, per se, or folder. Um, icons, uh, so I mentioned file extensions, file types, there's also MIME types, and then just the list of permissions. Uh, and we, yeah, we support wildcards as well in, 
in the file types and, and extensions. So at the moment, there's only four permissions, but the idea is to add more when we see good use cases. Um, so I've, I've talked about store app data. Um, there's edit chosen files. So when an app says I can edit, I can hand, open whatever image files, then this allows you that the app, when you open a file with a particular app, that it can then overwrite that file. Um, there's read folder for folders for apps that can view folders, so like a gallery app or something like that. And then, the, so the first three are all kind of single player permissions. Uh, the last one starts to get interesting, which is uh, exchange messages with friends. Seems a bit, a bit left field. Um, <laughs> but, so we have a, a protocol in Pyrgos, which is a, a very simple chat protocol. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's eventually consistent uh, and end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, and all this does is allow an app to send messages to people you're already friends with uh, who have the same app installed or who, who you want to install that app. Um, and so you, you can imagine yeah, asynchronous things like um, you know, multiplayer games like chess or whatever, something like that. It's not really real time yet. Um, one day we'd love to have a permission which is real time stream to my friends over a lib P2P stream. Um, and then you could do things like network doom. Uh, there are a couple of parameters which apps get. Um, there's, if you're opening a file or a directory, you get the path and whether or not it's writable and just the theme, whether it's a dark theme or not, which it can be useful. So this REST API, um, basically the REST API is in that service worker. So, the service worker in, in the, the OS process too, um, that's the thing that intercepts the API requests from the app and then translates them to post requests, post messages which are sent to the main tab and then handled there. Uh, oh, the other thing I forgot to mention here is the, uh, the subdomain is run in a separate operating system level process uh, to guard against side channel attacks. So uh, the REST API, so the, the, if you, anything uh, under the, the data path, that's, um, if you have that permission, that's the uh, app specific folder which you can read and write to. Um, you can, uh, an app without any permissions can ask you to save a file to your space. So it's a bit like a browser asking you to save a file except it ends up in your Pyrgos space. Um, that doesn't need a permission because the user has to choose a file name and a place for it. Um, and that's just, yeah, you just post to, to save. Uh, you can post a HTML form and store the results in a file. Um, and then there's the chat API. Uh, in terms of the files, so you can just HTTP get uh, a path to get a file. Uh, you can do, uh, because Pigos has native thumbnails uh, well for, for files that we can do a thumbnail for, you can add a, a preview equals true uh, query to get a thumbnail um, and yeah, post will create a file, put will update a file, delete will delete a file and patch will append. Uh, so it's all just standard classic uh, REST stuff. The chat API uh, is, is quite simple. Um, you can basically list the chats that this, this app has created. So you can't see obviously chats created by other apps. Um, you can create a chat. Uh, you can get the messages by, by index. There's just, uh, a, a chat is basically, a, a, your view of it is an append-only log of messages, so everything has an index. Um, and you can obviously send messages. Right, I'm gonna try some demos. Right, so let's just see, where are we? Uh, right, yep. So there's, let's see, there's, there's a PDF viewer. Um, so viewing this PDF is totally sandboxed from the, from the rest of the process. Uh, 
you can view spreadsheets. So here's an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, we can view it. Oh, sorry, that's the hex view. <laughs> Less useful. We need to disable that. Um, yeah, edit that in Lucky Sheet. So there we go. Um, so we can't edit Microsoft Office uh, directly. Uh, we have to save it to a, a more open format. Thanks, Microsoft. Um, which is a sheet file here, so you, you can edit those. Uh, there's a document viewer. Uh, is in Microsoft Office. So here's a document. Again, totally sandboxed. So that's probably actually a good, uh, probably the, one of the safest ways to view Word docs if you're worried about macros and all that nonsense. Uh, let's see, we have uh, a Winamp app or clone. See if the sound works. And so the other cool thing with apps is they're, I mean, they're, they're just folders in Pegos basically. So apps don't have to be public. So you can have uh, a private app that only you know about, or you can share it with your friends uh, and so on. So it's kind of an additional permissioning system to the web. Uh, let's see what else have we got. There's a text editor. With syntax highlighting. These are all still single player stuff. Uh, so the website viewer, I mentioned that. So this is just a folder uh, with some HTML. Uh, I'm going to view it. There it is rendered as a, as a web page. Um, I can open that in the text editor, the other app, and add something. And then reopen it. There it is, hey, uh. um, And the thing I mentioned about browsing Markdown natively. So here's a folder with some Markdown. Uh, so index.md, let's view that. So that's rendered the Markdown. Um, it's got links to, to other files, which are again, just files in Pegos. So what is that? That's, that's a to-do thing. Uh, this is a presentation. So that's a PDF file. So we can click on that link and it will open that in the, whatever app we have installed for it. Um, the images are again, you can, you can view them full size. Go to, uh, what's this? this is a sub directories markdown document with some stuff. Go back. If I want to edit it, I can just edit it here in place. close it and there we are five um, so that's the that's the markdown browser um, in terms of apps themselves so they, this is the, the sort of source code shall we say of some of the apps so um, oh here's another one actually let's, let's show this one uh, let's go in here so if you want to run an app in place uh, this is this is doom um, uh, right, yeah, so we just go run app down here. This is the manifest here. Uh, well, let me show you the manifest first. Uh, so, yeah, this is very simple. Some metadata display names, and the, the only important one here is the fact that it's launchable. Uh, so this is running Doom in an emulator, which uh, one of our team members wrote. Uh, <clears throat> Um, 
this is the shareware version, so there's no copyright issues here. Um, the, che the cheat still works, so that's cool. And it's, it's totally playable, as you can see. Anyway, um, that's enough of that. <laughs> um, and yeah, okay, what else is there? There's, there's uh, uh, let's go to the images. So there's a bunch of images here. Uh, I'm going to try editing this one in Paint Z. Doesn't look like that got the image, not sure why. Uh, I think Paint Z might. There we go, okay. So let's try something. Hi. Where's the save button in this app? Right, there it is. Coolio. So now, if we open this in the native view, there it is. Hi. <laughs> yep, I'm definitely an artist. Uh, one of the other things I guess I, I didn't show in the in the web viewer is uh, videos. You can play videos just like in any other website. Um, one of the cool things I'll talk more about uh, in a talk later today is fast seeking within large files. So this allows you to do seeking within videos. So this is this is not a huge video. It's 120 meg, um, but it's big enough, um, and so we can skip ahead and seeks forward relatively quickly and you can go backwards as well um, and the, the seeking there is O of 1 in IO uh, in round trips to the server depend uh, independent of the file size the, which is interesting right uh, what haven't I done So I guess we saw, yeah. So uh, yeah, if you want to create an app, uh, it's super easy. Uh, you just go down here, go new app, pick a name, choose the permissions you want. Uh, Okie okay, dokie. And it will create a little template app for you. Uh, what do I call it? Fred, where's Fred gone? What's going on there? There we go. So Fred's there. So we've got our manifest which, what did I ask for? I asked for store app data, so that's there. Some other defaults. Um, and basically an assets folder with an index HTML. I'm not sure what's actually in this HTML. Let's, let's run it and see. Thread, okay, cool. Makes sense. Uh, oh, and another app we have uh, is, is a calendar. So this is one of the, this is a more useful one potentially. Um, so the model here is you can have multiple calendars. Each calendar is a folder, uh, and events are standard iCal files within that folder. Um, there's a little hierarchy for, for, for the date, but that's about it. Um, and so that gives you you can use the native access control to share access to individual events. So. So we've got an event here, which is the IPFS thing closing party. Uh, and we can share that via a secret link with anyone. And if I go to anyone, aka an incognito tab, and paste that. So there we go, we've got a, we've got a link we can share with anyone to, to view the event. You can also share entire calendars. That just shares the, the folder that the calendar is in. Uh, cool, that's probably enough on the demo side. Uh, let's go back to full screen, yep. Um, so Safari, unfortunately custom apps don't work. Um, there are two, well, two-ish reasons for this. Uh, one is service workers and writable streams inside an iframe. It doesn't work in Safari. It works in all other browsers. 
I don't think there's a good reason for that. I think they just haven't done it. Um, if you know a Safari developer, then please please put us in touch. Uh, the other one is localhost subdomains don't work on Safari. Uh, I know PL is pushing on that independently, so that's cool. Um, but yeah, well, it's almost there. But it works in all, all the other browsers. So yeah, get building. Um, you can uh, the, there's a, a book.pigos.org with an app section you can have a look at. All those example apps I showed are in a repo here uh, in Pegos example apps. And I showed you, yeah, you can get started and create an app super easily. Uh, any questions? How am I for time? One minute, bingo. Uh, I have a question about uh, building an app and you know keeping the code isolated. If I were to try to um, sell an application inside of Peergos, is that possible today and be profitable, but also like secretive of my source? Yeah, so the, you you control the access to the app. So if I mean you can't, there's no in-band charging or anything like that. But if you have your own charging mechanism, you can give people access to it and grant or remove permissions based on some other. Okay, cool. I mean, once they've installed it. They've, they've got a copy of it, but you can stop. Yeah, they have updates. the source at that point, right? They can stop. Get, you can stop them getting updates after that. Okay. Cool. Thanks.